the Joe Rogan experience. Doesn't nicotine as well? Nicotine has some sort of a um, nootropic prof, uh, b benefit to it. Not not encouraging people to smoke, but you know you could take it in various forms, particularly gum. I know people take it in gum just for the uh, nootropic benefit of it. Yeah, I'm not encouraging people to take anything, but there's a very, very famous uh, Nobel Prize winning neuroscientist who uh, I went to his office to visit him in New York and he chewed seven pieces of Nicorette during that half hour meeting. And I was like, what is going on here? And he said, well, first of all, it increases plasticity. And second of all, he has the belief, and this is not a clinical study, but he thinks that it can also hold off certain forms of Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. Didn't I, Bertrand Russell, wasn't he like a, a famous smoker? Like he wouldn't even... Oh, I don't know. Think, I think he wouldn't even go on a plane unless uh, there was a smoking section because he couldn't imagine not having his pipe for uh, a certain amount of time. Well, creatives, you know, when I think when smoking became less in vogue, I think creatives really suffered because it's very clear that... So nicorette is nicotine mm -hmm. and the acetylcholine binds to the nicotinic receptor. That, so it, when you take nicotine in cigarette form or in nicorette form you're actually increasing the release of acetyl, the action of acetylcholine in the brain. Yeah, I don't smoke cigarettes, but I have. And the only time I have is before shows because I have friends that are comedians that would smoke and I'd be like, give me one of them things. Let me f see what's going on. And I smoked, I was like, whoa, dude, you get high off these things. This is crazy, particularly if you don't smoke cigarettes. You get this really weird high. Well, your receptors have never seen that level of, of nicotine before. And they, right. They like that. It's exciting. Yeah. Yeah. And so at the, for those moments, you know, your, your acetylcholine is like a spotlight. Mm -hmm. It brings your vision literally into this more kind of portrait mode where you can see more like a narrow window of what's going on. There are behavioral ways to access this too. Before a fight, you know, if somebody's really ramped up, their world is not, they're not seeing everything. They're probably, I've never done the walk, of course, but probably walking out to the octagon, they're not seeing all the, the color of the hat of the woman in the corner. You know, they're not relaxed, they're hyped up. Right. But that's a trigger for plasticity because the brain needs some way to cue this plasticity process to let itself know, because it's a self-learning organ, let itself know that something's really different. That's adrenaline. Something's changed. Then there's focus, what's changed? So in the jujitsu example you gave earlier, it's the ability to focus on wh what the sequence is, what happens when, and okay, I, I did that correctly or I didn't do that correctly, but that's duration, path, and outcome again. And having acetylcholine and noradrenaline up, that sets the plasticity trigger. However, that doesn't guarantee that those synapses are gonna change. It does not mean that you're necessarily gonna learn. Oh no. What guarantees that that process will be converted into literally the change in the connections between neurons, sometimes new neurons, but mostly the change in the strength of the connection so that eventually you don't have to do duration path outcome, you can just be reflexive about it, is states of deep sleep and any state where you're not doing duration path outcome. So we know from two recent studies, some of this was done by my lab, but by other labs as well in humans, which I think is important to distinguish between mouse and human when, where we can. A lot of the changes in these brain structures occurs after learning during deep sleep, in particular slow wave sleep. But it also occurs during periods of naps and shallow sleep, or even just periods where people deliberately decompress, where they're not focusing on any one thing in particular. So if we were gonna kind of uh, operationalize this process, it would be focus intensely, have an intense period of urgency, and then access the deepest rest you can where you're not thinking about anything, where space and time becomes very fluid. So stress in that case, post exercise or learning session would actually hinder your ability to grow and get better. Absolutely. Oh. And elite performers like elite military, elite athletes, I'm sure you're familiar with this, they understand that the ability to toggle back and forth between these high alert, high attentional states and deep rest is not just the key to performing what you can already, what you can already do, it's also the ability to get better over time. <laughs>